Many of the Japanese swords used in World War II were crummy, but a significant number of them were old, what are called ancestral blades uh, that were, had been in family possessions. And these blades, if they're well cared for, will last forever. I mean, it's brilliant metallurgy. Uh, and many of the old, the Japanese blades in World War II were ancestral blades, which meant that in a junky scabbard, iron scabbard, with junky, you know, World War II furniture, as you call the handle and the, and the handle guard, there could be a blade of extreme historicity, is that right? Of historical provenance. I think that's right, and worth millions of dollars, and particularly to the Japanese mind, because they do seem to still be obsessed with the samurai past, as we're obsessed with the cowboy past to a certain degree, and they still tell the stories and they still revere the heroes. Still, it's very vivid in their imagination. Uh, and I, I began to see how that sword could be the f could be the centerpiece of a book that involved all kinds of elements of Japanese crime and Japanese uh, bad behavior. And we could have put in this capable American bobbly swagger in the middle of it, and we might have a really interesting mix. It's great fun. I mean, it was really, it's probably my favorite year. I mean, I just really enjoyed, I came up, I'm trying to describe what the book is, and there's no real word for it because I combined traditions uh, played off both traditions. It looks, it compares the two traditions, but it also contrasts them. And I Which sort of, two traditions? Sorry. I'll say the Western gunman, the lone gunman, and the lone samurai. They're very similar in certain ways. This is the Western gunman. Bob has always been a lone, a lone gunman. And yet, as similar as they are, they're both capable men, uh, but they also have distinctive personalities and differences. The samurai has an ideal of obedience while the gunfighter has an ideal of freedom. And I wanted to play off on those ideas. Then it just came together and as I said, I just really had fun. Well, it's obvious when you read it that there's a lot of energy and fun that came from you because, you know, that's the reaction that I think the reader gets. One of the great things about it um, is the fact that you've written three books for Earl mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you've written, what, three books for, Not for Bob. Yeah. So, what is there about trilogies, by the way? Can I interject that? What is there that's sort of magic about threes? I mean, I don't mm. ever have authors come to me and say, I wrote a tetralogy yes, about Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, I don't know. There are magic numbers. Uh, if you're going to raid a town or defend a town or uh, take out a German command, a German radar center, you always go with seven. Seven is the magic number for raids. Three is the magic number for books. And I don't really know why. I mean, I, I can only think that in the, the first book, you're sort of getting used to the character. In the second book, you've found the voice, but maybe not the story. And the third book, you're finally making it all work. Is, is one suggestion, I, but I don't know if I that's true. I wonder if it relates to this sort of three-act structure of, of drama, and that's, to some yeah, degree, the yeah. you know film is is more or less an extension. Of that's that. a that's a very good point. In fact. Look for it in a Steve Hunter movie review very shortly. Oh, good. Well, there is, I mean, it just was interesting to hear you had this moment in which you've done three for Bob, you've yeah. done three for Earl. Interestingly, you wrote Bob the Younger, the son, first. Yeah. Then you did three for Earl, and now comes the story where almost by necessity you have to, you have to bridge a gap between yeah. them because for a Japanese sword of historical value and great symbolism mm. to pass into American hands, about the only place that was really going to happen in odd circumstances was during Iwo Jima, the war. During and, the war. And Iwo Jima was a great place. So yeah. you've got Earl. Yeah. And then it wouldn't be that weird that somehow Earl comes home or the sword comes right. to America yeah. with Earl. Because, I mean, how many stories have we heard now about returning soldiers bringing back Absolutely. from Europe or yeah. wherever great yeah. treasures? So all that works. And then yeah. Bob, I loved it that you sent him to Kenilworth. I grew oh, up right yeah, next yeah. door yeah. in Winnetka. Yeah. And I'm well, I grew up a little bit further out. And I, I can even tell you who, whose house that is. Which one? Uh, it's actually, I located that house. It was actually in Winnetka. And I moved it down into Kenilworth. On it's, Sheridan Road? Yeah. I yeah. thought it might be. Yeah. It sounded familiar. Yeah. How great. Well, I mean, I, we both went to Northwestern. Yeah. But we'll, get, we'll get back to that. But in any case, here you are, and Bob somehow, you know, this rummaging around in the attic routine. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. voila the sword. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you've managed at this point to get Earl and Bob in the same book on the page and kind of. Yeah, that was very satisfying ways. to me because uh, one of the things that's happening is Bob grows older. He's more like his father. He's turning into Earl. Now, when he was young, he was very taciturn. He didn't talk much. He definitely defined himself as an outsider. But as he's growing older and his physical skills are somewhat diminishing, he's discovering a sort of deeper skills that his father had quite naturally, like ability to lead men, uh, the ability to. Uh, he's discovered a, a, a sort of a. He has a sort of very powerful intellect, even if he's not. Uh, even if he's not, you know, an erudite, nutrier, northwestern graduate like us, you know, he's 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 got one of those really strong native intelligences because he was never put in the box by his education. He's capable of thinking outside the box and bringing in disparate elements and solving, finding solutions that other people don't find. He also, I. I I hope he's a little bit funnier. He was pretty grim and ticked off in the first couple of books, but now he's sort of relaxed into his style and uh, uh, he's a more voluble, uh, amusing, sort of more twinkly figure. Now Just people like get, you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, absent, absent the courage, <laughs> the skill, the aggression, yeah, and the stamina. But other than that, quite well, a bit you, like you me. You know, you've gotten remarried. You've yeah. given him a wife, yeah. you know. Yeah. It reminds me of my yeah. old friend Les Roberts. People yeah. used to there say, when are you going to give Milo yeah. some kind of love yeah. life? And I remember him saying, when I get some, yeah. Milo gets some. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was such a great answer. Yeah. But in any case, yeah, Bob, 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 um, is is a loner, but at the same time, um, that's good because nobody who wasn't would go off to Japan. No, that's right. And get into this mess. But let me finish another point, which I really like thinking about Earl. You know, you're talking about the loyalty, the code of the samurai, and, mm -hmm. the, and the structure and the ritual and all. It's not that different than Earl as a marine. No, that's very true. Um, in Iwo Jima, and I thought one of the really kind of interesting mirrors was your chapters about the battle in Iwo right. Jima are fabulous. Yeah, thank you. But I thought what Earl was doing there with his men and trying yeah. to, you know, was not that different than what a samurai would have been doing that's exactly fighting right. for his lord. I assume you intended that. Yes, I did. <laughs> I, I did. Yay. And it was important to show that Japan is. Uh, it was It was. It was important to show in the beginning. Because a lot of this also has to do with the relationship with the Japanese officer's family. And it was important to show Earl, the Marine Sergeant, versus Hideki Yeno, who is the Japanese captain, and to see the play of their minds against each other and realize these, that these are both extremely formidable, capable soldiers who understand the concept of duty and understand what it may inevitably cost and are willing to run that risk and who are both men who are who understand the awesome responsibility of leading men in battle and know that they're going to have to say you go over there and when he goes over there he gets killed you know and they're willing to live with that responsibility and uh, so it was a way of sort of uh, bringing you know all the themes of the book sort of uh, giving them their first deployment in those opening chapter I really thought it was extremely well. I mean, I haven't read a lot of uh, World War II mm -hmm. battle scenes right. in the Pacific. I remember Victory at Sea, which mm -hmm. was fabulous yeah. for the naval. Yeah. But um, I, it felt so immediate when yeah. you well, were writing you. it. And, and I really liked the fact that both Earl and his opponent were, were prepared to die. Yeah. And in fact, both of them really expected to yeah. die. Uh, in this, yeah. and you left it so when we go away from that scene, we're not totally sure how it all uh, yeah. played out. Yeah. But then you might find out in the end. Yeah. <laughs> and then when Yano comes, is it pronounced Yano? I'm Yeno? sorry. Yano? Is that how you pronounce Iwo Jima? No, not Iwo Jima. Yano. Oh, yes, Yano is correct. It's Y A N O, so yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, when his son comes to, um, to Bob in Idaho. Yeah. This book is all over, by the way. Yeah. You're in Idaho. Thanks for the little Arizona scenes. Yeah. Those were nice. Yeah. What was with Ajo? Ajo, Arizona? There is an Ajo, I know, Arizona. but it's hardly ever. The only reason I know it, it was the hometown of a, of a officer in the unit that I was in, in uh, when I was in the Army. And it always stuck in my mind, you know, because it's such a strange little word, A-J-O.